Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Project Egg Show. Today, we have the honor of speaking with Chris Hollifield, the co-founder, co-host, and producer of I Am Salt Lake. How you doing today, Chris? Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for, uh, for bringing me to your show, man. Absolutely. The pleasure's all mine. Let's jump right in. No more dilly-dallying. What is your story? What is my story uh, as far as podcasting? Is that kind of what your or story in life? I guess just life. what is my story? Well, my story in life, I mean, I'll give you kind of, I'll bring it all in with podcasting and with life, how I ended up here in Utah, all of that. Uh, well, first of all, let's see, I was born in Southern California, Ventura, California. I moved to Utah when I was 15, 16 years old but I hated it, right? Like I was just like, no, I don't wanna live here. This place is horrible. But being under the age of 18, I stuck it out. And I actually took off, I actually moved out to the East Coast when I was like 18 years old. I'm like, I am out of Utah. I hated it here, believe it or not. And then now I do a podcast about this place, go figure. Moved out to Pennsylvania. I lived out there for about six years, but I came back to Salt Lake eventually. Uh, I was with a girl out there, we broke up. My heart was broken. So as any good son does, they come crying back to their mom and they say, mom, save me, be my savior. And through this rough time, but I told myself, I go, if I move back to Utah, I'm going to live in Salt Lake City, like right downtown Salt Lake City, because at my mom and at that time, they all lived like an hour outside of Salt Lake City. So I'm like, if I'm going to do Utah, let me do Salt Lake City. So to kind of fast forward a little bit here, it was probably, I'm going to jump into my podcasting, kind of how I got introduced to podcasting, because all that rest of it, that is kind of uh, boring to hear. Uh, it was about 2010, 2011, some friends that I met through some other friends, they were always talking about this podcast they were doing. And this is like nine years ago, right? I'm like, what's a podcast? I mean, people are still asking that today. So... It was even worse nine years ago. And I started asking them, like, what is this thing you keep talking about, this podcast? And they kind of told me, and I'm like, well, that's just like talk radio. I love it. I love talk radio. They were doing a podcast uh, about comic books and geek movies. They still do the podcast today, Geek Show. Shout out to them if they're listening or watching. Anyway, it just seemed like a really awesome thing that they were doing and I was like I want to do a podcast but again like everybody asks themselves what do I do a podcast about right like that's all our question that we're always asking uh when we're about ready to launch a show and at that time Salt Lake City we weren't getting a lot of uh, comedians and big famous people through the city and Computer technology, in my opinion, wasn't as good as it is today. So I didn't want to do like Skype interviews or, or over computer. There really, really wasn't a lot of choices. So it was like, do them in person or over Skype. And so I was like, I want to do an in-person podcast, but what can I do it about? I was at the downtown farmer's market. We have this downtown farmer's market right downtown Salt Lake City every Saturday, all throughout the entire summer. And it's just full of all these local businesses. And it hit me, I was like, why don't I interview these people? These people are doing awesome things. They probably have incredible stories. I could do the podcast in person and I can meet cool people along the way, right? So I start telling this idea to people and I quickly get shot down, quickly told nobody's gonna listen. You know, your audience is gonna be so small, you know, not. A lot of people don't listen to podcasts. And then when you only do a podcast about Salt Lake City, that's going to even, you know, make it harder for, for people to find you or for people to listen. And uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Dave Jackson over at School of Podcasting. I don't know if you ever listened to his podcast, Ben. Uh, but he, one of the things he taught me through his podcast listening is, even if you only have an audience of 30 people, that's the size of a classroom. And if you think about it, like that's a lot of people, right? So I'm like, well, shoot, even if only 20 or 30 people listen to this podcast, it's going to be amazing. So 
I, I started, I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I could carry my iPhone. Actually, this is, this is how I was going to record my interviews was on my iPhone. And just to give you a little bit of an idea the technology at that time, it was an iPhone four. So it was like way before they have done any magical things with iPhones. And I just thought I could walk around downtown Salt Lake and walk into a business and interview. I didn't know anything about setting up interviews. I didn't even know like good formats for an interview. I didn't know any of the proper things of it. And obviously I figured it out very quickly that you can't try to interview somebody during business hours because they would keep getting interrupted by uh, customers. So I kind of had to quickly teach myself everything. There really wasn't podcast stuff out there like there is today, Facebook groups and and I don't even know if Facebook, I guess Facebook was around, but it wasn't used like it is today. And so, yeah, I just, trial and error, man. When I started I Am Salt Lake, I did two episodes a week because I thought that's what you were supposed to do. And then I realized that there is no really, you know, supposed tos. And here I am uh, almost seven years later, rocking and rolling. I mean, I've gotten Best of Utah Awards with doing the podcast. I mean, I've gotten invited on, you know, uh, uh, to do commercials for, for local businesses. Uh, I mean, it's just opened up so many amazing opportunities. And the point of, of mentioning those opportunities is goes back to the beginning when I'm told it was a horrible podcast idea. And so, I don't know, that, that was kind of a, I, I, I feel like I was all over the place with that story. So hopefully it made a little bit of sense. But uh, yeah, I don't, absolutely. did that answer some of your question there? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So let's jump back actually into <laughs> your childhood. Oh, yeah. What sort of family were you raised in? You mentioned um, how you, you mentioned your mom at one point after the breakup, but what was life like for you as a kid? So life for me as a kid, I mean, if, we, if we're going to get real and honest here, uh, I had an interesting childhood. I was homeschooled my entire life. So it, it, that was really important to my mom. I wasn't a big fan of it because I, I always wanted to go to like public school because that was where my friends were. But it was important to my mom. Religion was very important to my mom. So that was, again, why she wanted to homeschool. Because to her, it was more important to, say, read the Bible versus do math. Okay, that's great. I mean, it's just, it is what it is. But it was one of those things that I had no control over as a young child because obviously what, what your parents say goes. But one thing my mom instilled in me is that drive of, of that, that entrepreneur drive because my mom, that was, that was in my mom. She was, to her, it was important to stay at home with my brother and I. And so she was always looking for these like little side hustles and these little businesses that she could do from home. And so growing up, I was always watching that. And I was always seeing what she was doing. And even though she, you know, she got caught up in Amway and, and a lot of those pyramid multi-level marketing stuff, but there was, there was something exciting about that as a young child, watching your mom. Because I grew up, my, my, mom, my parents were divorced, if uh, you didn't kind of catch that, uh, just of that story. But... Uh, so I, I was watching my mom kind of, you know, push herself and try new things, try new business ideas and constantly be trying that. And so as I got kind of older, that was instilled in me. And so that's why I've always been trying new things and trying new business ventures and trying new uh, entrepreneur things like that. So, yeah. So it seemed like you had a really strong relationship with your mom. Um, what was your relationship like with your dad, if you don't mind me asking? Well, it was virtually non-existent. Uh, and that really wasn't, as, I, as I've gone older and gotten older in life, I found out through uh, some other family members and through some of my other siblings that were from his side of the family, uh, that my dad always wanted a relationship with me but it was kind of my mom that kept me from him. So, but even, even down to that, it's like, yeah, I have my own beef with my mom for that, for kind of keeping my dad away from me. But at the same time, she was just doing what she thought you needed to do. Now, since then, my dad's passed away about five years ago or so. 
And so that uh, obviously that relationship was never able, able to uh, continue. It, it kind of continued a little bit in my 30s, but it really wasn't that strong because it was one of those things. It's like, where do you pick up when you had so many years where you weren't in each other's life? And even though I think both of us wanted to be in each other's life, we didn't know what to, uh, how to, how to restart that. How about your siblings? What was the dynamic between your, uh, your various siblings? So I, I grew up, uh, I had an older brother and a younger sister that I actually grew up with. Even though I had, I have other siblings, I just, growing up, it was always my brother and my sister. And that's, that was kind of just the way it was. And he, as I'm older now, it's, I mean, I do have to acknowledge me brothers and sisters especially who knows they might be listening to this right so I want to tell them I love them too it's just the way I grew up and and that was my dynamic so my older brother was kind of like my father figure right like he taught me a lot of things on on life and I always looked up to him and I admired him I mean he got me into skateboarding and punk rock and and tattoos and growing a beard you know we both have big beards now and I mean he's he's always been I've always looked up to him still to this day. I do. And it's really cool because I actually have our podcast studio is in his shop uh, in the back of it. So he, he opened up a, a vape shop, uh, like an e-cigarettes, uh, the electronic cigarette shop here in Salt Lake city. And when he opened that up, he's like, Hey, let's, let's put a podcast studio in there for you in the back. I have this extra room. And so it was just really cool. So it's really cool to go record podcasts there. I'm not, not recording out of there today. I'm at home today, but uh, it's just really cool to to see him admire what I do because I've always admired what he does. So it's been a, it's been a lot of fun to, to grow up together. And my younger sister, she's like nine years younger than I am. So it we never have had like a crazy good relationship, but it's really cool because uh, I, I have a baby, a, a one and a half year old little baby daughter, and she had. Uh, a set of twins or twins, a boy and a girl that are three months younger than my daughter. So it's been able to, it's been fun to see those kids and, and kind of get closer to uh, my sister that way uh, with the kids. So when it came to being raised and your brother kind of being this role model for you, did y'all talk about you know, the, these kinds of things that y'all talk about the family, like what was your, what was your day to day? Like who were, who did, were you really, uh, who, who were you as a kid? Like, what did you like to do? Oh gosh, as a kid. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I like to skateboard a lot. Yeah. Uh, that was a big part of my, I'd say probably 10 years old on to into my twenties then when I got in my 20s, I had a lot of jobs that didn't have insurance. So it was kind of one of those things to stop skateboarding. And even back to skiing and snowboarding, I think that was a big deterrent on that as well. We were talking about that, I believe it was off the recording. But as a kid, a lot of skateboarding music was really important to me. I, went, I started going to a lot of uh, uh, live concerts at a very young age, like 13 years old. My brother uh, started taking me with him to that and growing up in Southern California, I mean, we were going to LA and San Diego. Uh, younger than that, I mean, I, would, I, I don't really know. I, well, here's a fun fact. I, <laughs> actually, what kind of kid was I been? You kind of got something out of me here. I, I used to want to go to clown college. I used to do birthday party clown shows. There's a fun fact about me that I haven't thought about for a little while. Uh, all through my teens, I was uh, very, I, I, want, I was like, where am I going to go to college? I'm going to go to clown college. And so I started doing birthday party clown shows for the neighborhood. And then people started passing my cards out and started getting jobs and making balloon animals and doing magic tricks. I was having a lot of fun, but so I was like 16, 17, 18 years old doing this. But then I got involved with animal rights and all of that whole scene, the vegan animal rights. And so it was like, well, you can't go join clown college now because that would involve you having to work for the circus. And if you're into animal rights, you're not going to go work for the circus. And I know this sounds crazy probably to your listeners that somebody would even consider this, but I was genuinely considering joining the circus more or less by, by going to clown college. So 
yeah, gosh, I haven't shared that with too many people. And it's fun. I mean, I don't, it's obviously not a secret, but it's just something I haven't shared. What attracted you to that? <laughs> like, yeah, why, clowns, why were you? Right? Why yeah. clowns? Well, <laughs> I, well, I could, I, I, I was, I was 10 years old. I remember it to this day. I was 10 years old and I watched a special on TV. It was like the 20th anniversary of Clown College, and it was hosted by Dick Van Dyke. It was on the television. I recorded it on my VHS tape, and I just watched this over and over. And I loved watching these clowns and these, it, you know, Dick Van Dyke. I mean, I still love the guy. I was watching him make people laugh, and I was just watching him be silly. And that was just always something I've enjoyed doing: is making people laugh, entertaining them, trying to let them have that escape for just a moment from their day and so at 10 years old I, I I was like wow this is cool I could I could make this a job and I started just kind of teaching myself how to do it and then I got involved in 4-H and 4-H had some clown stuff and that some classes or something as I'm trying to kind of remember spark my memory here but it was just kind of I think it was just that entertainer part of me and then again that entrepreneur side being like oh I can make money from this too do you feel like the things that you did preparing for clown college and, and going down that route, do you think those skills that you've learned have contributed to your success as a podcaster? Absolutely. 100%. I, I've always been the type that's not afraid to push the limits, not afraid to try new things, not afraid to kind of go outside the norm. And as a podcaster, I think that's why I've been as successful as I have with doing a podcast about Salt Lake City because I'm not afraid to try new things. So often uh, I see this in Facebook groups a lot where people, they just want to hear how it's worked for other people. Like, oh, well, how have you grown an audience? And it's like, well, why not try something out of your own head on how to grow an audience, right? Like, I mean, we've done things, I mean, even down to, we had a billboard for, for our podcast, right? Like on the side of I-15 and it was like, why not try it to see if this helps us grow an audience? And it was good. I mean, it wasn't incredible, but it was, it was fun. And I think sometimes people don't think about those things of like, oh, I could do a live show inside a bar and charge people five or $10 to come and see me record a podcast. Or I could put a, put, yeah, stickers up. I mean, there's so many ideas and, and I think that's important as podcasters to have a successful show is to go outside the norm. When you, I believe you said went from this desire for clown college into <laughs> more of an animal rights stance that was seemed like. Yeah. Yeah. Like you. animal rights, vegan, you know, try to save the animals. What was the, like, where did that come from? Why, why the pivot? Uh, well, I was very involved with like, just wanting to kind of keep my body clean, right? Like I did, I didn't do drugs, didn't drink, none of that stuff. I was just into, I had, I had some friends that were very, uh, they were a big influence for from me back to the skateboarding, back to the punk rock. They were just all involved with the whole like drug free, Let's, let's keep our bodies pure. I, I think it was more of a statement too, right? Like we saw so many other peers of ours that were getting caught up with drinking at a young age and drugs at a young age. And we were like, well, no, we know that that stuff is bad for us, but yet we didn't want to be called, uh, you know, we didn't want to be look like we were, you know, we wanted to be still cool people, right? So we kind of put on this hard image and, you know, we said no to drugs, but then a lot of us went further and started doing the vegetarian life, started doing the vegan life. And me, I'm always like the type that I have to go the extra mile. I always have to go further than everybody else. So I'm like, I'm going to be vegan. And, you know, I'm not going to wear leather shoes. I'm not going to wear, you know, I'm not going to eat honey. I'm not going to drink milk. I'm not going to, do any of this this stuff and I don't know where that comes from I think it's just kind of a I'm a I'm a I'm an extremist I like the shock value I think too and I just like to 
see how far I could go. So are you still like that? I mean, do you still um, maybe practice veganism? Is that I'm not sure what the right way to say that. Yeah, no, uh, actually, no, I'm very much the opposite. I, uh, so <laughs> about a, a little over a year ago, uh, well, so I stopped being vegan in my mid twenties. I just stopped completely. I was like, I, I saw myself kind of getting a little weird in the head. I didn't vacuum my carpet because I didn't want to kill the dust mites. And I would yell at my friends for making macaroni and cheese in my pots and pans. And so I'm like, okay, this is a little bit too much. So I just completely stopped being vegan. Now it's funny because about a year and year and a half ago, I started doing the keto diet, which I don't know if you're familiar with keto, which is like tons of meat. <laughs> so it's funny because here I am talking about being vegan and saving the animals. And now my diet consists of a lot of uh, eggs and bacon and, and hamburger. And so it's just really funny. A lot of, a lot of animal products now. So when you say that you were like an extremist and you always wanted to like take it to that, to that next, <laughs> next level, um, I, I really don't think I've ever heard um, of anybody not vacuuming their carpet to protect the dust mites. I, I, I think mean, it's, I, awesome. I, it's, it's funny, man. Like now I can laugh at it. I mean, it's a little sad. I like, I wouldn't want to leave the house because if I drove my car, my rubber tires had bone marrow in it from animals. And so it was like, I felt like I was never doing good enough, right? Like instead of being happy with what you have or how your diet is going or whatever, it was like, I kind of started isolating myself and I was like, I can't go out anywhere because I can't trust the food that's out there. I can't drive in these cars that are made from animal products. So basically I can't exist. And I mean, I was, I was ready to go into a mental hospital. I mean, if you really want to dig deep. And I was just like, no, I got to, I got to step back from this. This is not the best way to live. But, you know, here I am 20 years later and I mean, I'm 41 now and I can look back at it and laugh and just say, okay, I learned a lot from that time in my life and it's helped create who I am right now. What was that moment where you were like, whoa, this has gone you know, way farther than I thought it would. I need to, I need to make a change. I need to do something differently. What was that turning point for you? Uh, from my memory, if my memory serves me correctly, it was when I got mad at my roommate's girlfriend for making macaroni and cheese in, in one of my pots and pots, uh, my pots and pan set. And I was so upset because I was like, I just bought this and cheese hasn't touched it. And he was, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, if he's listening, he might correct me on this. If I'm not mistaken, he was ready to move out because of this. I, cause I just went crazy. And I was like, I can't live this way. This isn't like, I, I don't know why at that moment I stepped back, but I just remember being like, I am chasing everybody away. And the whole idea of saving the animals, like, these animals, like, I love them. I love animals still. I mean, obviously everyone, you know, but I was like, I got to save myself here. I'm going to, I'm going to end up in the funny farm. I'm going to end up crazy in the head without any friends just because I can't be accepting of somebody else's lifestyle. Let's talk about podcasting, right? Cause you mentioned how, you you kind of had a few jobs here and there and you were always starting stuff or trying different business ventures. What were some of those, uh, I guess, milestones in your career that led up to podcasting? As far as like other jobs that I've had or? Yeah, jobs, businesses, whatever entrepreneurial pursuits you've had. Well, in my, so, so I'm trying to think here how to word this. So for about three to four years in my uh, mid twenties, I think it was, I used to be a full-time eBay seller where I'd go to estate sales and uh, garage sales and thrift stores and find vintage clothing, usually old concert t-shirts, old Levi's, old jackets, old cowboy boots, stuff like that. And I would buy them and then resell them on eBay. 
And at that time, especially, that was a really uh, lucrative business. And I mean, honestly, I don't know. I mean, I, I've never really thought of the correlation of how to correlate that to podcasting. But I think, again, it goes back to thinking outside the box on ways to create an income and ways to funnel an audience into uh, what you're doing. And so then I, I got involved with MySpace. If, you, if I don't know uh, how old you are, if, if you had a MySpace or not. But I, I made a, a MySpace group for around, like with my vintage clothing, like vintage clothing lovers. And so I'd always be trying to, uh, you know, guide people from the, the MySpace page over to my eBay auctions because I figured, well, if I can get more eyes onto my eBay auctions, my clothes could sell more. And so I think a lot of that, I mean, gosh, even after listening to that now, isn't that kind of what we do with our podcast? Like, let's post it on a link on Facebook and then get people over to listen to our podcast. So, um, gosh, I don't know. My mind kind of got sidetracked there. <laughs> um, what was your original question? Just kind of what, 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 uh, what businesses and what things kind of led me into podcasting? Is that? Yeah, like some of those milestones or, you know, just – Maybe fill in those gaps between, you know, when you were younger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've I've always had just no jobs I really had ever kind of was lined me up for podcasting. Uh, I I mean, I actually had a really horrible job up up until uh, about a year and a half ago up through a big majority of my podcasting. Uh, I worked at a warehouse selling granite slabs just just a dirty yucky warehouse way underpaid uh working with horrible uh co-workers people that put me down every day making me feel worthless but for some reason i stuck that out for a lot like well 11 years so i'm not sure why i was there for 11 years a bit embarrassed of that but i did um but i honestly i i can't i i can't really think of a ton of uh of uh, milestones other than than just podcasting in general so it seems like you were selling on ebay yeah you you were doing some myspace stuff you then worked in uh in the warehouse selling granite selling granite granite Mm -hmm. slabs like big countertops we didn't do any of the cutting we just sold it so i I would help customers come in and select their countertops and uh, nothing special nothing special there and so during that time, I believe you said about maybe seven or eight years ago, you, you started your podcast. So maybe you could take us through those initial steps when you started um, to really start getting traction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started, it was, it, the first episode was launched in August of 2012. That was the very first episode. I didn't know what I was doing. But again, back to what I was saying in the beginning, I knew I wanted to do a podcast. I knew I wanted to do one in person. And I was listening to a lot of podcasts like Mark Marin, WTF, The Nerdist, uh, comedy interview-based podcasts, and they were all doing two episodes a week. So I figured if they do it that way, that's the way I need to do it. And I just... I just started, I started reaching out to anybody and everybody at the time, just kind of bringing whoever would interview me, basically trying to build some street cred because a lot of people didn't know what a podcast was. They never heard of I am Salt Lake. And so I knew I had to build a little bit of a catalog up. And so I was just kind of interviewing anybody and everybody. I didn't really care. I wasn't out to make money. I was just out to have fun. I thought it'd be great. It was one of those things, honestly, that Everybody told me that, hey, if you're good enough, sponsors will start hitting you up. And so I was like, well, if I become good enough, I'll, maybe a sponsor will get me. But that wasn't necessarily uh, my main goal. And I just started interviewing people and I started uh, having a lot of fun. About a year into doing the podcast, I went through a divorce. This is where it can get kind of spicy and fun. I went through a divorce. Um, and it was one of the darkest times in my life. It was, it was a very, I'm 35 years old at this time. And I felt like, wow, now what do I do? But since I was doing a podcast, I figured, hey, this is a great way to meet new people in Salt Lake City, to get my mind off all this 
horrible stuff going on in my life. And I was actually, it's funny because I, I, I needed to get out of the, the place I was living, obviously, with my ex-wife. And I just moved into a tiny little studio apartment. And I was doing my podcast right there in my studio apartment. I mean, it was tiny here, Ben. I mean, it was like 200 square feet, but I didn't care because I was just like, I love doing this podcast. I want to meet people. I wasn't out to impress anybody. I'm like, I'm just trying to spend time for myself. So to kind of um, go forward, I mean, I started getting recognition from different city awards and different uh, local newspapers saying, you know, uh, best podcast in Utah. And so that obviously I started getting excited there. I start developing relationships with some of the local businesses. Uh, I did a lot of trade sponsorships in the beginning where they would give me product if I talked about them on the podcast and I'm some like, oh, wow, you know, this doing this show, it really can turn into something. Uh, and gosh, I could give you seven years of history here. Uh, but yeah, so I'm trying to think, trying to think where to go with that conversation. I mean, I just kept going and going and going. And then actually, I don't know if you want to get into my wife, my, my wife now, Chrissy, who co-hosts the podcast with me. She, because I started the podcast by myself, but now my my wife now Chrissy, she co-hosts it with me. So I, I mean, I could share that kind of that story of how she got involved with the podcast. I want to hear it all, brother. Let it rip. <laughs> well, okay. So I feel like I, I I'm not I'm not good on the to be on the other side. I feel like I should be interviewing you. It's about three years into doing I Am Salt Lake podcast that I was ready to quit. I was ready to throw the towel in and I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't, I, I felt like I was alone. I, I would at that, again, at this time I was doing the podcast solo. So everything I was doing, I was having to answer every email. I had to, you know, I didn't have money to really have a web designer. So I was doing everything alone. And I was just like, what is the purpose of this? Why am I doing this? Uh, I started dating this, this girl named Chrissy, who I'm currently married to and currently co-host the podcast. And she, one of the reasons I was attracted to her is because she actually did a podcast as well. So she, she was familiar with what I was doing. She did stand up comedy here in Salt Lake city. And so I was like, this girl is awesome. And I started telling her about this conference called podcast movement. And I was like, look at this. Doesn't this look amazing to go hang out with all of these podcasters? And she's like, let's go. And I was like, okay, you and I, we've only been dating like six months. And now you're telling me like, let's go to Chicago together to this podcast conference. Like, is that weird or should I do this? Right. And then to top it off, she's like, oh, let's go visit my family on top of it. Cause her family was up in Wisconsin. And I'm like, We've only been dating for six months. What am, what am I doing? I go, well, worst comes to worst, I'll hitchhike home from Chicago, right? <laughs> I, well, I really did think that. I was like, well, anyway. So <laughs> went to podcast movement, and that, that's really what changed my whole podcasting outlook. That's, that, going to that conference saved my podcast because that was the moment I realized there really are no rules in podcasting. It's the Wild West. I mean, there are the basic rules, right? Where you have the RSS feed and you, and you know, you have your podcast up in Apple podcasts and, you know, you have to have a show tonight or artwork, but it's at the same time, there's no right or wrong way to do it. As long as the end thing gets done, right? As long as people are able to listen to your podcast. So that really like helps solidify things that helped me realize, okay, I need to go out there and hit up sponsors. I need to do this. If, if I'm going to make something happen, I can't sit back and wait for people to come to me because that's, that's how I thought you did it. You just sit back, you wait for sponsors to come to you. And so I, I started getting very proactive. Chrissy started getting more and more involved. Uh, she, she, redid our website because that's what she's a web designer and so she came out with this amazing website and i was like oh my gosh i love this girl she rebranded it came out with all the new logos basically just 
made it look amazing. And I still felt though that something was missing from the podcast. And so I said, Hey, why don't you come and co-host this with me? Why don't you come and do this with me? We weren't married yet though, then. And so I was very nervous because I was like, what if this doesn't work out? What if like this relationship doesn't work out? What if anything, right? I mean, it's, it's a scary thing when you're doing a podcast solo and then you want to bring somebody else in. And then that person that you bring in wants a little more responsibility. And then you have to say, oh, okay, we'll do this. And then you worry, is it going to be done right? Because you feel like you're the only one who could do things. But uh, so she started co-hosting with me. And, and, and really, honestly, I don't know how quickly it was, but it was pretty quickly. I was like, all right, this is the, this is the missing link. This is what I was missing with I Am Salt Lake. And now we're, we're just this crazy powerhouse team that uh we podcast together now we we actually uh are are helping people launch podcasts together we started another podcast together we go to podcast conferences together like that's our vacation uh it, it, we talk podcasts all sometimes i'm just like i think we should talk about something else besides podcasts uh because <laughs> you're like that's all we ever talk about, but uh, we have a lot of fun together. We've been uh, married for uh, two years in May, and we have a one and a half year old little baby together. And uh, we live right downtown Salt Lake City, and I'm just having the time of my life, man, doing doing what we do together. So, are you now full time working on the podcast? So. Yes and no. It's kind of a mixture of, of a few things. So doing I Am Salt Lake podcast, we interview a lot of local businesses and a lot of local authors and a lot of local entertainer types. And when we would bring them into our podcast studio, they would start asking us questions like, well, how do I start a podcast, right? Like, how do I get this going? How do I do this? And so I was like, well, I can help show you. And so I started showing a lot of people, helping a lot of people. And I don't want to say abused me, but I think a lot of people you like kind of would take advantage of me. And uh, a couple of people were like, you, you know, you know, you could be charging for that, right? And I was like, charge for that? I was like, I just want to help people podcast, right? Like that, I just I didn't really think a whole lot about it. I just, cause I felt so alone when I started because I didn't really have any teachers. I felt like it was my duty to help other people. Well, I was like, all right, I, I you know, I'll charge a couple of dollars and start doing this. And, and, uh, it kind of started, it just kind of snowballed into this kind of this coaching consultant, helping people, you know, whether they didn't have a podcast or they currently have a podcast. And then with getting my wife involved, she's a UX designer. So she does all the, she, you know, she's great with, with all the website stuff and the user experiences on people's websites. And she's like studied logos and how to get the most attention in Apple podcasts and all of that end of it. So the branding, the logos, the artwork, and then we bring that over into the podcast coaching. So we've created this, this, business together there uh podcasting is easy.com is where you can see all of that information there uh, and then i also do like podcast editing for other podcasters so it's kind of all these different funnels of bringing in whether i, I bring in sponsorship money from i am salt lake we also sell merchandise mugs and and t-shirts and flasks and shot glasses we sell that uh, mail order. And then we're also lucky because my brother has a couple of shops in the Salt Lake area. So we can do that. And then to make it even better here, Ben, I launched a beard oil company. You can see my luscious beard here in the video. If you're watching the video, quite uh, luscious for those on audio, <laughs> by the way, uh, I started that back in October and, it, and it's nothing big. I mean, you know, I sell, sell some bottles here and there, but it's fun because I could talk about that on the podcast and get some orders that way. And then plus just being able to use my own beard oil. And so I kind of have my hands in a few different things, but it's kind of all started because podcasting has kind of opened up that, that um, 
that door for me of, of meeting the right people and connecting to the right people and having an audience to sell my products to. So when you were deciding on the different ways to monetize your show, how did you make those decisions? Like, how did you, how did you decide, okay, now I'm going to start the beard oil company and now I'm going to start, I mean, that one's obvious because of how yeah, luscious gonna, your beard yeah. really is, but, um, you know, start the beard, um, oil, then do this thing, do that. Like what was the chronology and how did you make those decisions? So, well, in the very beginning, I was the type that I just didn't want to ask people for money. I had a PayPal button on my website and I want to believe I never asked for money. Maybe I did. Maybe I asked for a donation. I can't remember, but I started, you know, I'd get a donation here and there and that was cool. But it was, again, it was like $20 here, maybe in two months, another $10. So I was like, okay, that's cool. But I was like, let's try some different things out. And so I did a lot of trade in the beginning. I did, I traded with, with uh, like a local, there's a local concert venue that I was like, I reached out to him and I said, hey, what would you think about me talking about you on the podcast? I would say you're a sponsor, but you give me some free concert tickets. Cause I was like, I'm already going there anyways to see these live bands. And so they were like, cool, right? Okay, that's great. And then I approached like another place and actually it was a, another, another local beard oil company that I hit up and I was like, Hey, give me some beard oil and I'll talk about you on the podcast. And what really hit me was, and I can't remember the exact time. I want to say it was about three years, three to four years, somewhere in that time frame of my shift of podcasts. I got approached by a local business that said, I want to sponsor your podcast, but I need to be able to write that check out to I Am Salt Lake, right? I can't write the check out to you. And so I was like, huh. I was like, I guess I got to turn this into a business. I got to go get this registered, right? But, you know, because, hey, I didn't. I'm, hopefully no, nobody's listening from the feds or anything. No, I'm kidding. But because I didn't register. I mean, I didn't have it registered as a business or any of that. And I know a lot of podcasters like register their business of their podcast before they even launch the first episode now. But it was at that moment I was like, wait a minute, this guy wants to write me a check, a pretty decent sized check but he needs to write it out to I am Salt Lake. And so I'm like, okay, I need to turn this into a business. And it is at that moment, I was like, I got to treat this like a business because I wanted to make something of it. And, and there's nothing wrong with treating your podcast like a hobby or then there's nothing wrong with treating it like a business. But when I say treat it like a business, I'm like, let's get serious about this. Let's like really get serious on advertising, serious on booking people for the podcast making sure there's an episode that goes up on time every week and not you know you can't say no like if you have a job it's tough to call in sick so treat your podcast the same way is how i how i thought um but yeah so i got i got that license or i got got it registered as a business well actually thanks to my wife chrissy she took care of all that she's my my saving grace with all of that and then i just started reaching out to businesses. Chrissy came up with this amazing media kit. Um, and you can actually see samples of that on our website at podcastingiseasy.com. But it, again, this is another thing as a podcaster, I didn't even know the first, like, how do I make a media kit? What do I say in the media kit? How much money do I ask for sponsorship? And again, this goes back to pushing the limits and pushing you know, back to my clowning days and back to my other entrepreneur adventures where I'm like, why are we thinking in this small box? Let's think outside this box. And so I did a lot of different trial and error and I, I, I'll, I'll, you know, Hey, okay, let's try this amount and see how many nibbles we get. Okay. Nobody liked that amount. Maybe it's too high. Let's go down. Let's try this sponsorship package and try six months, eight months, one episode, whatever, or maybe you just want to sponsor a Facebook post, or maybe you just want to sponsor a Twitter post. And I think a lot of people that I see currently, and a lot of people, uh, uh, people that I've worked with coaching is they, they want to do it exactly how other people are doing because they see that. And it's like, well, that worked for them. But how, how, how are you going to know what works for you without trying? 
And so that's kind of what I've had to do. And that's really been the whole thing is just trial and error. And I still, I mean, even the beard, I don't know, maybe that will end one day. I don't know. Maybe I'll shave my beard off. So now that you are here, right? Yeah. What, like, what are the next steps for you? Well, actually, hold on, hold on. Before we go there, can you take a second to really brag on some of the major accomplishments that you have achieved as of right now? Like, really, really, you know, take a second to brag on yourself. Sure. Well, I mean, I know I kind of skimmed over it, but if it wasn't for I Am Salt Lake, I would have never met my wife, my current wife. And I think actually that's how, now that I think about it, I think that's how you and I connected. You made a post in Facebook and you were like something about, I, I forgot how you worded it, but I was like, I met my wife through, through this podcast. And a lot of people kind of perk their ears up on it. They're like, what? And it goes back to, because she did stand-up comedy here in Salt Lake City. I, I had my eyes on her because I'm like, I want to bring her on. I am Salt Lake to interview her, but I have a crush on her. Right? And so I was a little shy, a little, a little timid. But she, and she knew of me because of the podcast. And it was eventually uh, one of those silly dating apps that we're like, okay, they're, he's single, she's single. And it, we got kind of thrown away that way. But we knew of each other because of what each other did. And so if it wasn't for this podcast, she probably would have never even messaged me to be 100% honest with you because I don't know. I just want to believe that she wouldn't have. But so, I mean, to me, that was probably one of my biggest accomplishments. I mean, I've had other amazing opportunities where uh, businesses have contacted me for being on commercials because they look at me as like, you are Mr. Salt Lake. You are this like, icon in the city right and so i'm like well that's cool and i've won awards i mean we got i got best new podcast in 2012 that was like again that was when i started so i'm like okay this is amazing last year i got best podcast in utah which is a big accomplishment here in utah because back to the beginning story uh when i shared about the podcast that influenced starting a podcast was geek show and they have a huge following here locally and they usually win it. And so this year I pushed a little bit harder and I told all my listeners, I said, guys, I really need your vote for this. So, so that was a big accomplishment. I mean, even the opportunities of going to some of these amazing conferences, being able to help pay some of my bills through just the podcast, not the coaching, not the consulting, not the beard oil, not none, any of that stuff but to actually be able to pay some of the bills from doing the podcast. I mean, that's amazing. Just the people I've met, man. Like I've done close to 400 interviews with people in Salt Lake city. And so I feel like anywhere I go, I, I, I run into, to, uh, to a friend, I, you know, I consider them all friends, uh, the connections that I've made, uh, through doing it. Um, the, but even the knowledge for the city I live in, I don't hate it here anymore, right? Like, I love it. Like, I'm like, Utah is an awesome place to live. And so, and that's all because of, of doing, doing a podcast. So for those people who they're hearing this and they're like, oh my goodness, I have to get in on this podcasting thing. Like, it sounds amazing. And I highly recommend everybody do because podcasting oh, yeah. is awesome. What are some of those first steps that you would suggest people take in order to get started on their podcasting journey? Honestly, I would say start it. There is nothing more frustrating than when I hear from these people that feel like, oh, I need to have 15 episodes. Even, the, even this whole myth that you need to have three to five episodes, I think it stalls a lot of people. It, it holds a lot of people back. I've, I've run into countless people that are like, well, I, I recorded two episodes like two years ago, but I never started the podcast. And I'm like, do you realize that if you would have at least launched one episode, that probably would have fueled your fire a little bit to actually do more? Now, I understand. I mean, there's probably people listening that are like, well, you know, if you do five episodes, it helps you kind of realize like how much work it is. And I do realize that because doing a podcast is work. It, you, you do. You feel like it's a full-time job. 
but I, I just think that that becomes a deterrent. So even if you just start with one episode, I'm going to tell people that second is don't like listen to every recommendation, do what you feel is the best thing. So often I think people, they go into, uh, I'm going to, I keep using Facebook groups as an example, but that's a really popular uh, way. A lot of people, I think, start podcasting. I see it all the time where they're like, tell me how to do this or how did you grow your audience or how did you start your podcast? And it's like, even our podcast here, Ben, are completely different. I mean, we, you know, we're, we're doing it over the computer. I do mine in person. Uh, you, obviously you ask different questions. You talk to different types of people. You have a different audience. So what works for you isn't going to work for me. And so, I mean, I guess it's good to like get ideas and suggestions, but I think too many people take too many of those ideas and suggestions to heart. Another, another important thing, and I'm going to say this right off, this, is, this, is a, this was a big game changer for me, is get rid of anybody on social media that you feel is holding you back. We all have those like imaginary people in our head where they're criticizing us or critiquing us, right? People that chances are they're not, but in our heads we're like, oh, and just for the sake of the recording, I'm going to say, you know, my friend Joe over here is like, if I, if I make this post on Facebook about my podcast, they're going to make fun of me. So I can't talk about my podcast. Get rid of Joe. If Joe is just going to tear you down, get rid of him. And that took me a long time to figure that one out. I'm talking like up until the last few years. I had a lot of negative people on, on social media that were telling me how to do my podcast. And if I would have gone back to the beginning and just gotten rid of them much different show so don't listen to the haters start your podcast with one episode even if even if it's not the best because you're going to probably only have five listeners anyways and and remember to have fun and don't start a podcast for money that's that's where i tell people so let's give people a breakdown and i'm also interested in this but I want to know like what equipment do you use? How do you pull it off from like hardware software perspective? Well, I have a, I have a few different, um, a, do, a few different pieces of equipment typically. So I have a nice zoom L 12 mixer board. I don't know if you've ever seen these things, uh, but they are, they're an incredible piece of equipment. So I do have that to use, but typically I just use a zoom H six. I know it sounds crazy. I have a place to record. I have a recording studio, but to me that works the best because I record right on the Zoom H6. I take the SD card out of my Zoom H6, put it into my laptop, and I edit right in Audacity, man. I just put I just put the music, add the intro, clean up, you know, the ums and the ahs and the dead air, and and I'm probably a little anal with that, but it is what it is, and. Yeah, so I use Audacity to edit. I've actually just recently started using Hindenburg. So I do have to give credit to that, but I'm not, not full-time using Hindenburg to, to put the intros and outros and sponsor reads. But, uh, and then the microphones I use are just ATR2100 microphones, which I'm using here today. Really simple setup, man. I, I, that's one thing I've never really spent money on. I've, I've not, the tech side of podcasting, I've just never really cared a whole lot because to me i see just as successful people with 500 hundred dollar mics as i do with 50 dollar microphones so chris i want to thank you so much for uh being on the show and, and sharing your story uh just have a few more questions for you and then then we can wrap on up sure. um, what is your philosophy on developing deep genuine and meaningful human connection be present so often i think a lot of people when they're in you know situations of spending time with friends or spending times with their loved ones they're not fully present there's so many distractions and i know i'm horribly guilty of this i've gotten a lot better where it's like if you're going out to dinner with a friend or you're going out to dinner with your wife or husband, put your phone down. You're going to get a deeper connection. You got that person right in front of you. Pay attention to every word they say because you don't know what they might be able to teach you, 
right? Uh, so yeah, I think, I think that's my answer. Be present. What is your greatest theory? My greatest theory? Uh, I might have to pass this one. I, I don't really have it. I, I couldn't say I even have one. Or I'd, have, I'd have to think about that one. So wait, do you want to pass or do you want to think about it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, let me think about it. Let's pass it. Let me think about it in case I can go back to it because nothing really comes to mind on that. What is your biggest fear? My biggest fear is dying alone and nobody will remember me. Why? Um, I really don't know. I, I really couldn't tell you why I feel that way, but it's, I have this weird fear of that when I die, nobody's going to show up to my funeral. Nobody's going to remember me. And I think that even goes, I mean, maybe that's why I do a lot of what I do because I want to leave something behind, right? I want to make sure my voice is left behind. I want people to remember that I made them laugh when I did make balloon animals. Um, I just want people to remember me. And I, I, I couldn't tell you why. <laughs> I don't know. I, that's a good question. Now I'm going to go ask my therapist. Why? Why do I think this way? When, when we were talking about, you know, your, your life and, you know, your business, your professional life, your personal life, uh, is there anything about yourself that you think is an important part of who you are that we didn't talk about? Like, what did I miss? Um, I don't think, I mean, I kind of, you know, I shared a lot of my story of, of homeschooling, going through a divorce, going through all these life changes. I, I really don't think I, I uh, missed anything crazy important. Obviously, in an hour, it's hard to really go over 41 years of your life, but I, I really don't think I, you missed anything all that important. And, you know, again, th I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, last question for you. Um, I'm 24. Sure. And I have a couple different businesses, but this show is my greatest passion. And knowing that, what question should I be asking you that I wouldn't think to ask? Well, you know, this is a fun question. I ask every episode that I do of I Am Salt Lake. I started this uh it might have been a couple years now. And actually, I got this from a, a podcast I listened to called The Solopreneur Hour. I don't know if you've ever listened to that show, Ben. But he asks, what did your childhood smell like? And every time I ask the person that, it's such interesting responses because a lot of people don't know how to answer that. When you ask them, it's really a simple question if you think about it. Like, what are some of the smells that you remember from your childhood? And I love opening up my interviews that way because you can usually find so much out about somebody by asking them that question. Well, that begs the question then, what did your childhood smell like? <laughs> and I knew you were going to ask that, but my childhood smelled like a mixture of the ocean and farm animals because I grew up with a lot of goats and chickens and ducks but I grew up about a five to 10 minute walk from the beach. And so I had that ocean air coming, coming in my, my windows and just outside. So mixture of ocean air and, and farm animals. That's a great question. And when, <laughs> when, you, when you pose that question, I immediately had an answer. It's, it's crazy, like it pops up in your head. And it's, but oh, you'd be surprised how many that. people don't know how to answer that. And I forgot, he's, he, my, on the podcast, when he mentioned it, he gave this whole theory on like how a person answers it, tells you this or that from a person. And I can't remember what that is, but I just love asking that because it throws a lot of people even for a curveball because they, they're not expected to be asked that question. Well, it actually made me, gave me the, the <laughs> sense of a, you know, a, a very fond memory. So I want to thank you for, uh, for. Yeah, feel free to use it, man. You should ask your people that. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, so again, Chris, I want to thank you so, so much for coming on the show. Um, you know, I really do appreciate the time we've spent together and uh, it's really, really been an honor to, to hear your story and to get to chat with you. Um, so seriously, man, thank you very much. 
thank you for letting me uh, come here and chat with you for a little bit. I, it's it, the honor. I, I mean, you, you have a great podcast here, so thank you. Well, you know, thanks again. And to everybody who's listening, I want to thank y'all because uh, y'all are the reason that I do this and, and your support, whether you're watching or listening, um, you know, really means a lot to me. And I, and I really can't thank you enough because y'all are the best. So I love you guys. Thank you very much. Chris, you want to wrap us up? Do I, what, say that again? You want to wrap this up? Yeah. Drop a tagline or do something cool or, you know, however you want to wrap up. Well, this is how I end every uh, episode of the podcast is get out and enjoy the city that you live in, support local, and we'll see you on the next episode, right? And on that note, we'll end it there. So thanks, guys. <laughs> Have a good thanks, one. Ben.